Thanks for joining us for this third and final part of our discussion with Dr. Ravi Zacharias and Professor John Lennox on Stephen Hawking's claim that God was not needed for the universe to come into existence. Professor Lennox is joining us by phone from Oxford, England. If you've enjoyed this discussion, we invite your comments. Well, Ravi, let's uh, talk about what we finished our last video discussing, and that was the way science views God. Uh, Stephen Hawking, in his book, made this comment. Let me read it to you. He wrote, the question is, is the way the universe began chosen by God for reasons we can't understand, or was it determined by a law of science? I believe the second. If you like, you can call the laws of science God, but it wouldn't be a personal God that you can meet and ask questions. Ravi, how would you respond to that? Well, you know, um, when you take a designer, uh, you have intent and you have will. When you take chemistry uh, and you say, uh, or physics, and say, this is all there is to it, do you realize at that moment, Bob, what they actually end up doing? You can never define good or evil without first defining purpose. That is, purpose is in, in, intrinsic to the definition of good and evil. And dare I, I, I raise a very difficult uh, uh, question then. If a personal God is implicitly debunked by the scientists, what does that say about personality? What does that say about personal worth? We are ultimately configured by uh, matter. So matter is prior to who we are. Uh, this is, I think, another point that Einstein made, and by the way, which uh, Anthony flew in one of his chapters in the book, There is, uh, a, there is a God, flew takes issue with the atheists, uh, especially Daw Dawkins and so on, who refer self-reference laws, and flew gives numerous quotations, even from people like Heisenberg of the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle of fame and uh, Einstein and so on, who sort of have this veiled realiza realization of some entity that has to be assumed behind the scenes, however we ultimately describe him. They don't want to give it the anthropomorphisms that we give or the Judeo-Christian uh, attributes, but they want a respect given to a transcending mind. And so to take away the possibility of a personal God is to ultimately destroy the value of personality itself. So I think Hawking once again here moves into a realm that uh, uh, I, I'm willing to give you some power, but I don't want to mind. I don't want a personal God. We have given him personal worth. He gives us personal worth by writing to us, all of which is nothing more with no ontic referent to give you personal value. When psychology deals with issues of personality, morality, and reality, all of them assume some kind of point of reference. You take away a personal God, Bob, and I think you have opened up uh, an arena of discussion that cannot respond to the most plaguing questions of our time. Could I just make a side comment on this? Mm -hmm. um, on the actual statement, if you like, you can call the laws of science God, but it wouldn't be a personal God that you can meet. I find that a very revealing statement for the following reason, that dismissing God, the creator, they don't dismiss the concept of creation. They have to ascribe creatorial power to something else. And here Hawking describes it, and he, this is another astonishing thing to my mind. He doesn't describe it to matter and energy as often is the case. He describes it to something abstract. That is, he describes it to a law of nature, but you only have to think for a moment. And it seems to be as a scientist, very odd for someone to do that. Laws of nature are abstract and they depend on the prior existence of a nature for which they are laws. So that to call them God in any sense and uh, as responsible for nature is just very, very confused indeed. And it seems to me that we're standing up against, again, the great choice. 
that either one believes there's a personal God behind the universe, separate from it, who created it and upholds it, or else you ascribe creatorial power to fundamental particles and the laws of nature. But you'll notice in all of this that Hawking doesn't tell us where the laws come from. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm reading an interview done by Wolfgang Pannenberg in which he was asked the question if he believed in God, in a personal God, and he says this, fascinating. May I rephrase your question? I myself should prefer the following formulation. Can you or anyone else reach the central order of things or events whose existence seems beyond doubt as directly as you can reach the soul of another human being? I am using the term soul, says he, quite deliberately so as not to be misunderstood. Then he says this, if you put your question like that, I would say yes. If the magnetic force that has guided this particular compass, and what else was its source but the central order, should ever become extinguished, terrible things may happen to mankind, far more terrible even than concentration camps and atom bombs. That's, you know, that's a, a quantum theorist saying, take away the order. This is not completely random. When the more the accretion of particles and instruments and the very human mind, he says there's a soulishness to this. And so to basically say that uh, um, you can call the laws of science God is, uh, is trying to find a way to escape the inevitable logic of his own thinking and giving a personification to an idea because that then gives him a will that he wants to bring in. Uh, Dr. Lennox, do uh, scientists know their limitations on theology? <laughs> well, some do, some do. <laughs> I, I think it's not a question of limitations on, on theology. You're raising a very important point. Uh, we referred to it very briefly earlier when I talked about scientism. That is the view that science is the only way to truth. Now, it seems to me that one of the very important things is for scientists like myself, and I'm very passionate about science, to realize that science is limited. And it's very interesting on this to contrast Bertrand Russell with Peter Medawar. Uh, Bertrand Russell was a brilliant mathematician, but he was the one who said, although he didn't completely follow this through, but he did say that what science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. And that's a classic self-refuting statement because it's not a statement of science, and therefore, if it were true, we cannot know it. So he, his great gift at logic seemed to leave him at that particular point. Sir Peter Medawar, on the other hand, he said this, it's very easy to see that science is limited. It cannot answer the simple questions of a child. Where am I coming from? Where am I going to? What is the meaning of life? And then he added, we've got to turn to uh, literature and philosophy uh, if we want any answers to those questions. And he pointed out that it does no service to science for scientists to claim that science can answer everything. And he was, uh, this is in a very famous book that I would suggest that every scientist could read. And incidentally, it's a favorite book of Richard Dawkins, I believe, at least Peter Medawar was a hero for him, called The Limits of Science. So it's very important to realize that. But you mentioned theology, and it's a sad thing that Many people, particularly the new atheist movement, they assume that theology is a matter of faith. They then assume that faith is believing where there's no evidence. So the deduction from both of those things is that you can't take anything in theology uh, seriously. So they don't. So therefore, they don't even inform themselves as to what serious theological debate has uh, given us over the centuries. And so the limitation of their knowledge on God is, is very great indeed. You know, I would, I would bring, uh, that's great, John, you're absolutely right, and we're grateful to the Lord that you're there for the listeners who 
who are not aware of John Lennox, uh, here's a man who's a holder of triple doctorates in science and philosophy. Um, here's what I would say. There are two edges to this question, Bob. Very important for the listener to hear me very carefully here. Think about this, and I don't mean to be audacious. When you take a man like Stephen Hawking, brilliant, amazing capacity to reel off equations, page after page after page, without looking at a note because of the brilliance of his mind. Isn't it fascinating that a man so restricted, confined because of this horrible, debilitating disease, some relativist who did not know the capacity of his mind, but knowing the capacity of this disease, having seen Hawking in the mother's womb, I know there are relativists and ethicists today who would have called for his elimination in his mother's womb. The very reason that a man like this exists and is given the dignity and the respect and the love of human beings and life is because of the Judeo-Christian value that every life has essential worth. Sickness or no sickness, disease or no disease, debilitation or no debilitation. Fascinatingly, he lives by the application of an ethic which in effect is debunked by his physical theory of origins and purpose and meaning and destiny. So he's living off the capital of a worldview that is being knocked by the book. That's the first thing. Those listening need to realize that the love and the value that is given to every human life is given to us because we see ourselves as created and loved by God. But the second edge of that is this. The church needs to wake up and do theology the way theology needs to be done. We have sent young minds into the arena without bringing unity in the diversity of the disciplines. Philosophy is important. Literature is important. Science is important. And so is theology, which used to be called the queen of the sciences once upon a time. And then theology was displaced by religion, which is man-made rather than seen as, as uh, divine in its uh, uh, ultimate pursuit. So I just think there are two edges to this. Those who trumpet the idea that God is dead need to realize that the very persons who are trumpeting it are given value and worth because of a belief in intrinsic worth, something their philosophy cannot sustain. And we, as a part of the Church of Jesus Christ, need to wake up and realize how best to prepare young minds to bring a confluence of these disciplines and not to ignore these questions as they come up. I'm tempted to add, Ravi, uh, perhaps rather facetiously, but I will add it, that also many of these people trumpeting these ideas are doing them in educational institutions like Oxford and Cambridge, which were Christian foundations. And the basic freedoms, and it seems to me actually, and you're hinting at that talking about ethics, but in general, our basic sense of human rights and freedoms are something that's been given to us historically in the West by Christianity. And these arguments are eroding them, but the people are only free to make the arguments because of the freedom that those traditions have given them. So right on, John. And I think that is possibly part of the extension of what Heisenberg would have said there, that if we take away that central factor of design in some way or a central order, and then you and I recognize that order doesn't come from things, it comes from the mind of God himself, that catastrophes and other ideas will take sway that will make the concentration camps and all look very tame. I believe this debate will always continue because there will be always those who will find a market for ideas like this. But uh, the central belief in the existence of a personal loving God who gives us our moral dimensions and our ability to reason will be indispensable to carry this world forward and we as philosophers, theologians, and scientists who follow Christ, follow uh, where God is leading us in our understanding of things, need to take these disciplines seriously and especially take our responsibility to the young. Let me finish with a final question to both of you. Uh, we started this discussion uh, talking about how this was not a new idea. Uh, this has been out there before and these ideas have been debunked before, but it's making a huge splash now. Uh, we have a colleague in South America who says it's all over South America, Hawking's recent comments. Ravi, why do you believe it's getting such attention now, even though these are not new ideas? 
Well, these uh, ideas sort of hit the fan because I think in some ways some people, uh, you know, like uh, Aldous Huxley said in 1946, he wants this world not to have meaning because a world without meaning gives him uh, an autonomy to his ethics and his moral framework. So we all like to think, aha, I can run free now, no more restrictions, no more moral ideas. That may be one, that it gives them the legitimacy of autonomy. The other thing I think is they sort of see this imposition of a God idea with all of its conflicts and tensions and religion and all that it has created, uh, do away, consider it all passe and walk away from it. That may be another reason. Uh, the third one may well be that uh, science is being given this sort of central chair in everything, and therefore St Stephen Hawking has spoken, quote, therefore God has spoken uh, of reality. Whatever the motivation, I don't think it'll ultimately linger this way. Uh, when ideas come and take sway, they linger for a little while, they become the topic to discuss in the West, particularly anything beyond 90 days is sort of passe and old. And uh, I frankly think on the positive side, many scientists who are not even Christians or theists for that matter, and philosophers have risen to this and said, this emperor has no clothes. And uh, Hawking, they think some have said like Roger Penrose and others who worked with them, have done them, has done himself a disservice by moving in this direction. And so it doesn't even take the theist to have to respond. It takes other brilliant scientists to say, this is not scientific, or as John Pokinghorn would have said, pure speculation. Dr. Lennox? Well, my reaction is very similar to Ravi's, that I think possibly part of the aggression in the country where I come from, Northern Ireland, aggression is usually associated with weakness of argument. And <laughs> I, I think that some atheists at least are running out of real arguments. The second thing is that the cultural authority of science, because it's given us spin-offs in technology, is enormous. And therefore, when famous scientists speak, people think that everything they say comes with the authority of their science. But of course, not all things that scientists say are statements of science, and we've got to learn to distinguish. And in that context, I'd like to end my contribution by saying that throughout this discussion we've had, and it's been very interesting to me, we need to keep one thing clear. Ravi and I are not talking about a conflict between true belief in God and true science. That's the way that so many atheists want to paint it. You either believe in God or you believe in science. And as I said directly to Richard Dawkins in one of our debates, I said that is a false choice. And if you give it to people, some of them might just want to believe in God so that you could be accused of actually turning people away from science. What I'd like to emphasize, and Ravi hinted at it in his last couple of sentences, is this. This debate that will go on is much deeper. It's a debate between two worldviews. The worldview of materialism or naturalism on the one side that says this universe is all that exists and there is nothing that transcends it. And the world of theism, and in our case Christian theism, that says this world is not all that exists. There is a creator who created it and it depends on him. That is the battle. And the crucial thing to see is that there are scientists on both sides of it. And that tells us very clearly that it's not a simplistic warfare between science and religion. It's a worldview warfare. And science is being called in to adjudicate. Well put, John. Well, Dr. Lennox, thank you very much for taking time to join us from uh, across the pond, and we do appreciate your time. It's a great pleasure, and I just hope you've understood my across-the-pond accent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the interpreting from here, John. God bless you, friend. Great to have you on. Thank you very much indeed.